afternoon. I hope you are all keeping well and safe. My name is Joyce O'Connor, and I chair the I'm chair of the Digital Futures Group here in PIIEA. You're all very welcome to our webinar on misinformation, challenges for European democracies, and the role of the European Digital Media Observatory. Our distinguished speaker, Miguel, Professor Miguel Madura, is chair of the executive board of the URC. European Digital Media Observatory. You're very welcome. And thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Miguel will speak to us for around 25 minutes and then we'll go to the questions with you, the audience. You may like to send in the questions during uh, Miguel's presentations. As you know, you can submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'd really appreciate when you're asking questions, if you could give your name and affiliation, I'd appreciate that very much and, and thank you for doing that. Please join us on Twitter and our Twitter handle is at IIEA. This presentation and the Q&A are on the record. Miguel, your presentation is timely. You couldn't have got a better day for what you're going to speak about. We all come to see how debates about public issues play out on social media and receive our news via digital platforms, as we've seen, as we know only too well in the US election and indeed in Brexit, politicians pitch their policies using social media. The internet now is our public square, and I think we've all come to understand that. But the exposure of all our citizens to large scale disinformation including misleading or outright false information is a major challenge and growing threat to European society and democracies. And as part of the EU action plan against disinformation, the European Commission has established the Digital Media Observatory in June of this year to help fight against this uh, disinformation. So today, we're very pleased and lucky to have Miguel here with us. As I said, it's very timely. And we're right at the beginning of the development of it, this exciting uh, observatory, Miguel. So we're really pleased to have you here for that. And I'd like to give a brief introduction. You've got a very distinguished career, an academic uh, advocate general and a European public servant. Miguel's research and publications have been recognized worldwide where he's received a number of awards for his work. Years ago, you'll remember this, Miguel, you're a Fulbright Fellow in Harvard, but he's also been a visiting uh, professor at the Yale Law School, the Chicago Law, Law School, London School of Economics, and Keogh Law School in Tokyo. Currently, as you know, he is the chair um, of the executive board of the European Digital Media Observatory. He's visiting professor at the European University Institute, where he was previously the director for the School for Transnational Governance, an advocate general of the European Court of Justice. He was also a member of the EU high level group on media freedom. I'm so pleased here that you're with us today, Miguel, and um, we look forward to your presentation. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, before I present the, briefly the, the, what the European Digital Media Observatory is about, what it will do, uh, I want to start by some uh, words about the challenge that we face today in terms of disinformation, uh, and particularly the challenge that it represents to our societies and our democracies in particular. Uh, this is a challenge, if you allow me the advertisement that I address with a colleague of mine, uh, Paul Kahn, in a book that will be out in the coming days mm -hmm. that is called Democracy in Times of Pandemic. So I apologize for the advertisement for the book, yeah. uh, <laughs> but it is, uh, it is something that we address uh, on the extent to which actually this question of disinformation has also be, been rendered uh, both uh, even more relevant as if it was not already relevant enough by the pandemic, but also because the pandemic has served uh, to test 
some approaches on how to deal with this information uh, that some now uh, um, are thinking of transferring in how to deal with this information with regard to political speech. But that transfer is not absent of risks and challenges, and that's one of the things that we address in the book. And if you want, we can address that in the discussion too. Uh, but uh, now I wanted to, to start by a more general overview of the kind of challenges that this information uh, um, presents for uh, uh, democracy in general. Now, the existence of fake news and disinformation is not new. Uh, uh, we've had uh, fake news, disinformation, forms of manipulation and intellectual dishonesty for many years, including in politics. Um, but it, it seems that the phenomena has acquired a new importance today. Why is it so? Because of the role that uh, uh, social networks and the internet in general have had uh, uh, with regard to disinformation in increasing the impact and the challenge that disinformation poses to our democracies. And perhaps it is important for us to first understand why is it so, that is. Uh, uh, if it is not a new phenomenon, why is it, has it been rendered different? And why is it impact more threatening uh, in light of the internet and social networks? And there are four things that I think we can identify in what social networks and the internet uh, uh, do and bring uh, that increase the challenge of disinformation nowadays. The first one is that uh, is scale and speed. Scale and speed matter. Uh, we can say perhaps that the internet is to the spreading is to the spreading of information and ideas today, including false information and dangerous ideas, what printing was centuries ago. Mm. Uh, 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 printed, it was not simply a faster. Uh, uh, easier way to to spread information and ideas. It qualitatively changed the way uh, uh, ideas were discussed, the way information uh, 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 played a role in our societies, in some ways very positively because it increased uh, cooperation, for example. Uh, the fact that uh, 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 you increase the scope, the scale, and the speed of the spreading of information impacts on how it interacts uh, uh, um, on the nature of that impact. Uh, as uh, uh, not only uh, uh, because uh, it increases how easy it is to have access to information, but the fact that it becomes much easier changes the way we organize ourselves socially and changes the way we think about things, our cognition, our cognitive processes, uh, the information we are exposed, the ease with which we can access and then the ease with which we can convey our ideas. Um, uh, as, as actually science tells us uh, uh, regarding neur neurons and quantum physics, Large, num large numbers is not something more of something. It actually changes the nature of that something. Uh, quantity also alters the quality of things. And we see that with the, uh, uh, with the internet as we saw, saw that with printing. Now, it can have a very positive effect and we saw that with printing too. It was crucial to promote cooperation. Uh, it made ideas, it made information much more easily accessible, and therefore uh, uh, it had an exponential impact on development and economic growth. Uh, uh, but And it's the same thing with the internet, but it also, because it, it disseminates ideas and information, it disseminates both good ideas and bad ideas and both truth and false information. So it also brings challenges with it. The second thing, that uh, changes on the internet is the way that information is conveyed to us, uh, um, and particularly the role of algorithms. And these algorithms tend to uh, uh, establish and determine that the information that is more easily available to us, uh, uh, the information that is rendered more visible to us on our threads, 
on our uh, uh, pages, uh, on our searches on the internet, tends to be information uh, uh, that amplifies what have been our past preferences. In one way, again, this is good. It, it is good. It is a, a, a shortcut. It saves us time. Is it, it's, it's efficient in terms of looking for things that we want and things that we like. But in other respects, and particularly in the public, in the political sphere, it tends to narrow our perspective of the world. It tends to narrow the scope of uh, of ideas and 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 world visions and political uh, visions that we are subject to, and therefore this is this creates what is often referred to as informational bubbles uh, that reinforce our prejudices and reinforce the creation of political tribes. The um, uh, reinforce fragmentation in the public sphere, reinforce uh, polarization in the in, in the in the in the in the polit in the political sphere, through these bubbles, whereby we always hear the same things that we believe and that, and for which we've expressed preferences in the past, and are not subject to ideas that challenge our assumptions that challenge our prejudices, that challenge how we have always thought about something. So this is the second risk that is associated to that, is the creation of these informational bubbles as a, uh, as a consequence of algorithms and how the information is distributed and, and targeted at us. The third thing uh, uh, comes from profiling. Uh, because uh, the internet and social networks also um, collect a lot of information about ourselves uh, uh, and know almost what we think about uh, certain issues, it allows political messages to be uh, developed and then to be targeted by the way that the internet operates to uh, uh, in the almost at an individual level, fitting our particular preferences. And, and this politically political targeted messages uh, have an additional risk. It is that because they are uh, 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 almost exclusive to each one of us, they are not part of the public domain and therefore on the one hand, they cannot be uh, uh, checked by others. They cannot be challenged by others because they are almost not known. They are targeted to each one of us individually. And moreover, we might not be even aware of the inconsistency of those that address to us those political messages. Why? Because a politician could now, uh, through social networks, develop a political message uh, to myself that is very different than the political message that he or she sends to one of you, and without this inconsistency almost being detected. Uh, and therefore, this facilitates manipulation. This also facilitates exploring prejudices uh, uh, um, of, of concrete individuals. The fourth problem uh, uh, is that of anonymity. And again, as with all the other problems, this also has great advantages. The anonymity that the internet brings in some instances allows people in authoritarian regimes, in dictatorships, to challenge power without being detected. It also allows whistleblowers, people that otherwise fear that they denounce uh, certain facts of public relevance that they may be targeted because of that, uh, that they may, may be sanctioned because of that, and, and the internet allows them to be, bring forward this information mm -hmm. Uh, in a way that protect, protects them. But at the same time, anonymity also allows people to spread false information without being accountable for that. It allows people to share hateful and violent ideas without being accountable for that. It also allows the multiplication of fake profiles, therefore uh, uh, um, artificially uh, uh, amplifying uh, the impact of a message, because many of these profiles may share a tweet, may share a post, and in fact, it's not being liked by many people, but it seems as if it's being liked by many people and acquires a lot of visibility. So anonymity also presents huge challenges in terms of, of, of hate speech, 
in terms of radicalization of speech on the internet, more violent uh, language, and also in terms of the development of these the, these fake uh, profiles. Now, these four uh, uh, challenges uh, have an impact on the cognitive and epistemological uh, 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 character or dimensions of democracy, in particularly with respect to how political preferences are formed in the public space and in the virtual public space that is increasingly becoming our dominant public space and its impact then on political deliberation. It changes, uh, uh, um, this is a, a democratic cognitive and epistemological problem and, there's, and this is also linked to a broader problem that we have in our societies of political trust uh, 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 of the loss of political trust. Now, this cognitive and epistemological uh, problem regards how we decide, how we develop our preferences, our political preferences, uh, how we think about some things, how we come to form an individual opinion about something, what we believe, what informs our individual decisions, and how we transform that into uh, uh, a, cho a choice uh, uh, um, about something, and now in turn, these different individual political preferences are then aggregated through collective deliberation. Uh, uh, the cognitive and epistemological challenges that we have in democracy require precisely this. How uh, social networks, how the internet changes how we think and how we decide individually, and then how we collectively aggregate that into a common decision, into a public decision. Now, this is linked to broader aspects uh, beyond the changes in what we could call the means of forming political preferences that result from social networks and the internet that I mentioned about. This is also linked to deeper changes on the time of politics, uh, uh, the fact that decisions, the political decisions are increasingly being taken at a faster pace, reinforcing what, uh, in terms of how we think and how we formulate our political preferences, enhances the emotional dimension by comparison to the rational deliberative dimension of, uh, of our political actions. Uh, and it's also linked and, and, and aggravated by changes in the space of politics. Uh, and I won't be going into that, but basically I'm referring to an increasing mismatch between the space where we need politics, that is policies that often take place beyond our states, and where we have politics, where we still predominantly have politics that it is within our states. And this mismatch in the space of politics and policies disrupts uh, political accountability uh, mechanisms and distorts uh, incentives for political action. Now, uh, 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 this transformation in the cognitive and epistemological dimensions of democracy, these challenges to the cognitive and epistemological dimensions of democracy, many of which, as I said, uh, 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 fed by the role social networks and the internet have in the spread of this information, uh, are aggravated by a broader uh, uh, structural problem that we're facing, that is a problem of decreasing trust on, on politics and decreasing trust on elites. Uh, this is again uh, linked in part, in part, but not only in part, uh, to uh, the impact of social networks and the internet that has uh, increased distrust in authoritative sources of truth. Um, uh, and this means that we lose our trust in what I've called the traditional editors of democracy, media, political parties, unions, that ba basically those that set the agenda and used to frame the discourse uh, uh, on certain, on the political decisions that we'll have to take. Increasingly, this is taking outside and independently from these traditional intermediaries of democracy, these editors of democracy. Uh, and one of the reasons is because uh, social and economic developments uh, have led to the increased distrust on elites, but part of this increased distrust uh, is also linked to 
uh, 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 social networks and the internet because the fact that people have more easily access to information leads them to often confuse access to information with knowledge. Uh, the fact that we have very easy access to a lot of information does not necessarily mean that we have knowledge about all that, uh, 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 about, about those issues. Knowledge is a different thing from us, access to information. But the, but the reality is that today, uh, people increasingly confuse and co conflate the two, the, the, the two aspects. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for you to think about it, how this happens even outside the political sphere. You see how before, how we, how before we used to go to a doctor and, and, and the doctor will make the diagnosis of what we'll have, will prescribe us some, some drugs, will go to the pharmacy, get those drugs and take them. And today, most of the people go to the doctor and then they go on the internet to second guess what the diagnosis that the doctor has made, uh, uh, has made of them. And this is a, a, an anecdotal but a truthful uh, example of what happens in a much bigger scale regarding politics uh, and, and the fact that this more generalized access to information leads people to believe that they can become experts about almost anything and can second guess whatever traditional sources of authority, be them experts, scientists, and we see that even with the pandemic today, uh, 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 say about, about something. Now, this, in this generalized context of distrust, fake news uh, 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 can more easily spread themselves. Because if you believe that you can, if you don't have no reference points of authority, if you don't have authority sources that you trust to define what is truth and false, then it becomes much easier to spread disinformation, to spread uh, um, fake news. Now, uh, uh, what to do about this? I mean, uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, discussions going on on what we could do. Uh, um, and, and I won't go into all of them. I won't address the questions regarding how we could regulate this digital space uh, uh, the extent to which traditional forms of regulation uh, or, or, uh, on political speech or on disinformation can be transferred to the virtual uh, public sphere. Uh, instead, I want to focus on the aspect that to a large extent is the one that underpins the creation of the European Digital Media Observatory. Part of the answer must be first for us to know exactly what is the extent of the problem and how it works. And second, to increase resilience in the democratic ecosystem. That is to try to make people more capable by themselves to resist, to identify and resist this information. This requires media literacy. This requires transparency on the sources of information, on the sources of you read, but also on the data that is available for people to study this information. This may require also strengthening traditional media as part of those editors of re-establishing trust on authoritative sources of truth. Uh, 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 this is part of, 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 of the tasks of the European Digital Media Observatory. And it, it is in this context uh, that I believe the Commission uh, launched the call for European Digital Media Observatory, that the consortium uh, that is led by the European University Institute uh, uh, won, and and uh, and that I uh, of, and of which I am now uh, the the chair of the executive board. Uh, uh, and let me very briefly present you what in five minutes what Edmo he, 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 he will be doing and the main tasks of Edmo. Now, Edmo has five pillars that largely correspond to five tasks of Edmo. The first one is to set up a, an online platform uh, that supports on the one hand, the analysis of this information and the cooperation between the state, different stakeholders, but it's also about raising awareness, awareness to this information. It, it also involves the creation, the setting up of a governance body uh, uh, that is aimed to provide trust on what EDMO does and its different tasks uh, and supports uh, and facilitates coordination between independent fact checkers, between media literacy experts, and between these two uh, sets of stakeholders, but also supports and facilitates academic research on this area and, and creating a repository for the research that is being done in this area. And finally, 
uh, uh, it provides academic input and, and, and methodological support to public authorities, particular national regulatory agencies that are in charge or monitoring uh, EU rules in this respect, and, and, and notably at the moment, uh, the code of practice on this information. Now, the first uh, task, as I said, is setting up an online platform. We are developing, we are in the process now of making it available to, to fact checkers. Uh, it, it has both a public dimension uh, that makes the general public aware of what is being done by fact checkings, what is being done in terms of fighting this information, but it has also a private dimension. That is, it, it is also a secure platform to which fact checkers, for example, can uh, uh, register and can uh, uh, ask to be uh, members so that they can cooperate on joint fact checking projects. For example, fact checkers from different uh, countries in Europe uh, uh, can cooperate on a particular fact check Hacking, or they can know what other fact, check fact checkers are doing and use that in information. Uh, the governance structure of EDMO uh, is a governance body that is the executive board, board that I, that I uh, uh, chair, uh, that is composed mostly of the partners that lead the project, and then an advisory board that has representatives of stakeholders from all the different sectors, from ac the academia, uh, 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 to non-governmental organizations, to fact checkers, to media literacy uh, experts. Um, we also have as one of the tasks, as I said, the support and facilitating of coordination of independent fact checking activities in Europe. Uh, and, and aside from promoting cooperation within the different European fact checker, checkers, we map what's being done by fact checkings. We map the fact checking community in Europe and we will be making available repositories of what these fact-checking organizations are doing. Uh, but in addition to the fact-checking uh, uh, and to the media literacy, including training for media literacy that we'll be giving, we also facilitate coordination of academic uh, activities in Europe. Um, we do this by identifying the academic institutions, by creating, as I said, a repository, almost a library of what's being done in this respect. But we're also doing this by trying to make uh, uh, more easily accessible information, data from the online platforms for researchers to be able to know and study uh, uh, the phenomenon of the, this information on, this on these digital platforms. One of the most often uh, uh, mentioned problems that I've heard so far and criticisms to digital platforms is the limited access to data that exists to know with uh, uh, more certainty and with more clarity, uh, uh, how does it, the extent to which this information occurs uh, uh, on those social platforms and also how it is taking place. And, and we want to make that data more easily available by engaging digital platforms in the name of our community and facilitating the access of our community of, uh, uh, of academic experts or fact checkers to that information. And then uh, we also support relevant uh, policy activities. Uh, we report trends. We are now in the process of working on a common methodology that could be used by the different national regulatory agencies. For example, uh, 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 using common standards on how to uh, uh, monitor the implementation of the code of practice uh, um, and also be making recommendations on what will be necessary to make the code of practice work better in the future, or if necessary, uh, 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 what should be additional, additional steps to be taken in that respect. And we do that by engaging a broad community of stakeholders uh, that uh, uh, includes uh, uh, um, uh, regulators, national regulators, uh, academic experts, and the digital platforms uh, themselves. And in addition, we'll be cooperating and coordinating a series of uh, sub, uh, of regional uh, European Union observatories that will mirror EDMO, but will mirror it at the level of a member state or of two, three member states. And that will, and that it's a call the commission has launched. And this, uh, uh, in, the, in the first instance, nine new uh, EU observatories uh, uh, will be pulled together and coordinate uh, their activities all through, through the European Digital Media Observatory. Um, you can have more information about EDMO on our site, and uh, I will conclude my initial intervention uh, and apologize by the fact that I think I took 
five, year, five minutes more or three minutes more. Thank you. Thank you.